So hi, welcome back everyone. Uh, glad for joining us today. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, UI flow. I'm going to be talking about pro virtual agents. Those are a couple of those products that uh, Phil was just introducing and mentioning that those are fairly new to the Power Platform family. So let's dive into it, find out a little bit more about what they are and how they can help you. So my name is Haniel Cortoro. I've been working in this space for well over 15 years right now. Like many of you, I started my journey in SharePoint, and over time, I, I was a Power user, started learning more of these tools. Office 365 came out, started using uh, a variety, um, and something that I was often doing as part of my, my field, I actually started in, in uh, medical imaging orthopedics. I always tried to find a way to simplify and automate things, and so naturally I started to gravitate towards any automation. In the old days, it was SharePoint Designer, then it moved on to the Power Platform, and since then I've never looked back. I've been using this day in, day out. Um, everything I do in life, I try to automate as much as possible. Um, also, I've uh, I kind of published a book that talks about automate, uh, not just automation, but kind of the whole agile approach, and go goes into that as well as how can you use a lot of these tools to meet your everyday needs. Um, I have a couple of the hashtags if you want to follow me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Otherwise, we're going to be sharing some of the additional uh, information later on. All right. So we talk a lot about automation and, and uh, what it does for you, but really, why do we even need to automate things? So what are some of the key considerations? First of all, it saves you time. If there's any task you do manually, the computer can do it faster for you. So that's a, a pretty much a no-brainer. Reducing waste, so if you're doing any processes that require you printing paper, getting sign-offs, or doing anything like that, again, doing it through automation, you're reducing that additional waste. Reducing risk, so if you do manual tasks, because we are humans, errors happen, mistakes happen, there's a chance that you might be doing something wrong. If it's pro, uh, designed or set up in a certain way by computers, computers are pretty binary. They do something consistently, there's no, there's no uh, interpretation typically that happens uh, unless you ask the system to do it for you. So you're reducing your risks of that could be monetary or otherwise impacting your, your process. Growing your business. So, if you have people who are doing very mundane tasks and, and simple ta uh, simple things, rather than focusing on those, those are the same individuals can now have free time on their hands. They can actually help grow the business and generate more revenue for you. And then the last one is when there is no option. So in some cases, you may want to interface or get some data, manipulate it, but you don't actually have access to that system. So through automation, you can get access to that information without getting the keys to the kingdom. So those are just some of the key key uh, ideas of why do we even bother with you know Power Platform and, and all these technologies that we're talking about today. Uh, in terms of the overview, so Phil already gave it. Uh, we have a whole plethora of tools available today. The ones I'm going to be focusing on are the Power Virtual Agent and the UI Flow, which falls under Power Automate. The nice thing about it is that those two connect to all the other ones in a very seamless manner to really help you solve your, your everyday business processes. So just very briefly, so Power Apps is kind of your, your front end facing tool that your uh, people are going to be using to enter data, to view data. Uh, the demo that they did about uh, New York City uh, to me. So that is a very, uh, that was a very quick example, but you can go really expand on the abilities on the, interf uh, the interface um, using cameras, using GPS, using all this different information and bring it all together for a consolidated user experience. You've got your common data service um, that uh, is basically your backend. You're managing all of your information, which uh, somebody is going to be talking about later today. Power Automate, this is the workhorse. This is what does all of your workflow. It takes the data from one place, manipulates data, sends it somewhere else. Um, UI flow is actually part of Automate, and we'll talk about that, and I'll show you some examples very, very soon. Uh, but it, that kind of brings everything together. Uh, and then your Power BI, that's kind of your dashboarding. So you have that data in CDS, or you're pulling data through your Power Automate, and you want to be able to visualize it in a, in a consolidated, uh, meaningful way. Um, and you want to ask questions about it using natural language. Make sense of your data. That's where Power BI shines. 
some additional add-ons. Again, Phil mentioned AI Builder. So this is where you can take the what used to be very complex AI models and you can really simplify them for filling out forms, for predicting certain responses based on uh, historical information, detecting information in an image. So there's, uh, there's a few of those options and that just keeps uh, growing over time. And at the core of it, sits a very rich data connector ecosystem. Today, there is well over 300 connections to a, a variety of uh, cloud-based solutions. Um, you also have gateways to on-prem. So if you are working in legacy environments, you can actually get to those through the gateways. So really, there is you almost have limit, li limitless options available to you to build your automation. And then with the introduction of the UI flow, you are then also uh, closing the gap to systems that are legacy that don't actually have interfaces today. All right, so let's look at UI flow. So what is robotic process automation? So the idea behind it is if you are, uh, imagine there's a person sitting at the keyboard doing their work. If you're trying to replicate that work, there's typically are two ways to do it. One of them is having a, uh, what is called an API or an interface. One system talks to the other system, is sending a request. Please give me the data, here's authentication, information about it, or go and update some information. In some cases, systems are old, they're locked down, there may be other reasons why those interfaces are not available to you when you're trying to build out your business process. And so this is where the robotic process automation comes in. You're effectively mimicking the keystrokes and the mouse actions that a user would be performing. And so by, by using RPA, you're essentially bridging that, bridging that gap. So you see, for example, I have a screenshot of a, uh, a mainframe, a green screen. There may not be an API, but I can actually mimic that I have to click a certain button, an F key or, or uh, somewhere on the screen, and it would then provide me information. Now, if it's one uh, a very few tasks, you may ask yourself, well, I don't really need the RPA, but then if you start doing that in volumes, that's where it becomes a lot more beneficial. So you got the, the time-saving aspect of it. Uh, better use of resources. So again, rather than having a person doing a task manually, you now start to save time um, and allowing them to do other tasks. Reducing risk. I talked about that a few minutes ago where automating the process with RPA, you're essentially getting the same benefits. Uh, greater scalability, right? So imagine you have to repeat the same task over and over you're basically uh, allowing yourself to do that very rapidly than having to build up a whole team of individuals who need to do it. Um, and also building engagement and success, so you're, you're getting more information, you're being able to provide answers more quickly. A uh, very quick example, I was working on a project that had to do uh, some anti-money laundering. We were looking at millions of transactions. Uh, and the calculations was that we would need an army of probably a hundred different people to just go through it in order to get to uh, to all the information uh, and process it in time for when the client needed it. By using RPA, we were able to put something together, build out a solution in about a week, and then run it at a much, much lower cost and still provide all the information on time. So very simple, high, high level example, but there really are a lot of possibilities available. So UI flow is essentially Microsoft, one of Microsoft's answers to RPA to automation. Uh, it was rolled out last year in November. They started with a couple of plugins. They had a desktop, they had the Selenium for the web. And then very recently in May, Microsoft purchased a company called Softmotive uh, and they introduced a new product called Win Automation into the mix. And Wind Automation is a very mature product that has been used in, in a lot of uh, industries, a lot of companies. Um, and so right now that is being integrated into the whole UI flow uh, process, which I'll show you. And you now can leverage Win Automation as well as some of the other tools to basically provide you with that RPA offering that um, uh, you know, basically will solve that problem for you. In terms of who is it for, so you'll see when I actually go into the designer uh, screens that just like Power Automate uh, or Power Apps, which is meant for the citizen developer, you can build these RPA solutions without having to code. Um, at the best case, you may have to provide a couple of parameters, but there's no hardcore coding that you may need in, in some of the other solutions that are available on the market. And so with automation, 
So this is the tool that I was just mentioning that um, Microsoft purchased a couple of months ago. Uh, it is a very rich uh, uh, tool. It provides a lot of information, more than just uh, 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 entering data through mouse, through keyboard, and reading information. Um, it actually has integration with Excel. It has integration with SQL databases. They can actually run these processes as if somebody was sitting at, uh, at the computer. Um, advanced security, so that you know when, when banks and, and financial institutions are really concerned about the security element of it. So you can actually build a lot of gates to make sure that only the right uh, the right processes can get to very specific information. Um, other types of automation, such as FTP, uh, PDF generations from document, using computer vision and OCR, and a lot more. And what's nice about it is you can also script the whole process so that it can be even further expanded and, and scaled out and parameterizing it. Um, and you can do this for desktop solutions, you can do this for web solutions. So let me show you a very quick example. So here's a simple automation tool that I built, which is going to ask for a, an amount of money. It's going to say, what is my current currency? And what is the currency that I want to convert it to? Suppose there's no API today. There's a lot of websites, Google, Bing, others, where you can get that information. But suppose that there was no API available and I wanted to get that information. So as you can see with a couple of uh, actions, and I'm just going to open up one of them here, it's just asking a question. I want to store a variable. Where do I want to put the amount? I want to launch a website and I want to get the details and I want to close the browser. So a couple of actions. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to my flow window right here and I'm actually going to trigger this workflow so I'm going to run it there we go okay so let's say I want to do 2000 Canadian dollars and I want to convert it into British pounds and what you'll see is in a couple of seconds, it's going to pop up a window. It'll stay on for about a second or so right there. And that's going to close down again. But what you just saw was by it was basically running this script. So all I, ha all I had to do is in my flow. I had to if I bring up my window again right in here and I can show you what it looks like. I literally had a trigger where I'm asking for the amount and for the three values. I call my flow, give it the amounts, and that was running my win automation, which was basically those three or four steps to open up a browser, enter the information, extract the information from the actual page, and then return it to me. Now imagine that you have a system that has tens or hundreds of fields. Just building it out and, and having a system understand what it needs to get from where, it can do that for you and store the information um, and process it in other ways for you. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the nice things is that what you just saw is this Win Automation workflow is running as part of a Power Automate flow. And so before when I talked about the fact that there are over 300 different connectors available to you, guess what? Those 300 connectors, you can actually leverage information from them to feed your RPA workflows and then get information, get uh, uh, some outputs from your RPA and pass that back into those same 300 or so connections. So all of a sudden, you have great expandability in terms of what you can access. So that 300 number has basically gone up almost limitless because whenever there's no connection, you use your RPA for it. Let's do another uh, example of UI flow, and this one is using the, uh, the previous solution that they had. The idea behind this is I have a SharePoint list here, and I've provided it a number of names, and I want to know, are these people uh, MVPs for how long? What is the category that they're, at, that they're MVPs in, et cetera? And so I have my, my workflow, and I'm going to just run it. And what this workflow does is similar to the one that, that I was showing. It's now going to go and I'm going to run it. It's going to open up a web page. Every, for every individual, it's going to go through. It's, going, it's opening up a web page, which is the MVP, the Microsoft MVP web page. It's going to enter my name in here into this window. 
What it's then going to do is going to go to that page, look at that individual, found a match, go in, and then look on the left-hand side, there's going to be a blue bar. It's going to pick out the category. It's going to pick out the first year awarded. It's going to pick out the, uh, uh, the number of years the individual has been an MVP for, those three fields. And then what it's going to do, it's going to go into the SharePoint list, and it's going to populate this information. And so if I go and refresh my page now, it should be showing up any moment. OK, I'll wait for that in a second, but take my word for it that you'll see the information popping up here in the next couple of minutes. It'll gonna, it's going to have all the answers. There we go. This is my name and my information, and now it's going to continue to go through, but let's continue with the talk and come back to that in a few minutes. OK, so I'll, I'll refer back to this, uh, the example that I just did a, uh, a few minutes ago with the UI flow. Um, we're going to look at those results and see how we can actually leverage RPA for other areas. So let's switch gears now and talk a bit about the virtual agent. So when we talk about virtual agent, what we're really uh, talking about is a, a, a chat bot. So imagine you have a person who's typically answering a phone call or online, um, an, an operator or an attendant to provide information to a user. And so what chatbots do, they replace that individual. The idea behind it is that it uses text-to-speech understanding or text-to-text -text, uh, and is trying to provide a better experience to the user. Now, typically, how do you know if a, if a bot is good? There used to be something called a Turing test, which is a test that says that if a person is interacting with a system and they cannot tell that it's a computer, if they think it's a human, that means that that system has passed the Turing test. And only recently that was actually achieved where uh, some systems were built, some chat spots where people could actually not tell that they're not talking to another to a, to a machine. They thought they were actually interacting with another human being. So overall in the industry, there's a lot of advances that are being made in this in this field. And so what are the things you want to think about when it comes to chatbots? First of all, you want to improve the the uh, the user experience for the user, uh, and especially when you talk about shopping. The longer you keep somebody on the website, the better experience they have, the better chance you have for conversion. In other words, closing that sale. So you want to increase the number of visits. You want to uh, 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 prolong the number of visits um, in terms of cost savings, right? So having a computer run a chatbot is going to cost you a lot less. There is an upfront cost for setting it up, but once it's set up, it's going to cost you less operationally than having a number of attendants who then need to answer the phones uh, and provide the information. What's also nice about it is that you can do insights. So as people are clicking through, asking questions, the computer can actually take that information, analyze it, understand what is popular, what is not. Based on that, maybe you want to go in and highlight certain other information on the website to then draw more people in or, or when somebody's browsing for something, they all of a sudden see an ad for something else that might be related or something that other people may have looked at. And all of us, and you, a lot of you are probably seeing that when you just go to Google or Bing and you start seeing these messages pop up, these advertisements. Same idea with the chatbots. Um, inter, another consideration is where do you use them? So today, most of us are using whether it's, uh, it's uh, uh, the iMessenger or WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, whatever it might be. Um, we like those tools, we're used to them. We don't want to start adopting yet another tool. And so the idea is that these chatbots can actually be integrated directly into those technologies so you interact with them just like another person. Another good example is Microsoft Teams. So there is a lot of chatbots that can be integrated and plugged in directly into your team that allow you to then interface. You don't have to uh, build another solution or, or, or integrate something. So I'm getting some feedback. Somebody has their microphone on. Thank you. So with the Power Virtual Agent, the way that um, that it works is uh, it's it's highly uh, visual. Again, you don't need to be coding or anything like that. You can give it a set of questions. You can give it uh, the answers for it. So the questions are called topics and then the responses. Um, and there's essentially a decision tree that it goes through to then 
give you the uh, the next question or give you a response, and it, st it starts to drill through. What's also good about it is I talked about UI flow. I talk about Power Automate. Power Virtual Agent is part of that. It fits into that whole picture. So you can build a virtual agent where you ask the user a question, it then takes that, that information, passes it to a workflow that then opens up to all these, these connectors and other environments that I talked about, and then bring that back right into the virtual agent. So the user doesn't even know how, how far of a spread the system has to really get to the answer. Uh, we talked about analytics a little bit. So this is where you can start looking at the number of questions, the time that users are spending, uh, how often people are happy, satisfied or dissatisfied with the responses that they're getting from the bot. So let's look at a couple of demos. So if I wanted to build a new bot, First of all, I want to show you an example of how easy it is. So I'm going to create a new topic. So let's go to my topics. So if I wanted to add new topics, I might want to actually, rather than starting fresh, I can actually go to, to a website. Let's, let me just go into here. So I can give it a link. So right now, we're in COVID. Let's say I want to build a bot for getting information about COVID. So I can go to a website. I'm going to just pull up a URL that I have saved here. And this is from the World Health Organization. I'm going to say add. And so what it's going to do right now, it's going to scan the website. You can see right here it says several minutes. It's going to scan the website. And there's a lot of websites out there today that have their public websites. They have Q&A type information. So by using some artificial intelligence, the Power Virtual Agent can actually go to the website and get information from the website and provide you with, with suggestions for, hey, here's some questions and here's some answers that you might want to consider. So if I go to suggested, so it hasn't done it yet, it's still working on it, okay. Um, but it's going to, in a couple of minutes, it's going to come back and it's going to give the, uh, the suggested questions and answers for this specific website. Okay, so while it's doing that, let me open up another window here. And I'll give an example of the um, other one, the other demo. So remember I was doing the demo before for the UI flow where I was getting a list of my MVPs. So I'm going to go into a topic. Actually, I'm going to run my bot here. And I have a question called MVP winner. Or I can or any one of those questions would, would invoke the same the same response. I'm going to go into the builder so you can see what happens here. So I have my, my, any one of those questions would invoke it. So I'm going to say MVP winner. And so what it's doing, you can see right now in green, it ran the trigger, it recognized it. So now it's going to ask the question, who are you looking for? I look for you, Phil. I'm going to search. It's going to run a workflow, which we'll get to in a, in a minute. And then it's going to say, you know what? Sorry, but Phil is not an MVP. Well, let's say this was useful. I'm going to try the same one again. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually give it a name of one of those individuals that I know about. So let's say Hugo Bernier. So I'm going to go back to my workflow. I'm going to say MVP. Actually, I'm going to try a different trigger. So this time I'm going to say uh, who has the most MVP? Uh, no, just most MVP awards. Okay. I'm going to do Hugo Bernier. So I'm going to spell this name right. Great. So now it tells me Hugo Bernier is an MVP for one year since 2020 in the office development category. Pretty slick. 
you can see the logic that it actually went through. And what I want to do is I want to actually show you the details of the workflow that it ran. So I'm going to go in here. So those of you who have been working in Power Automate before, this should be really familiar to you. It's just a regular Power Automate workflow that I'm using as part of my virtual agent. And what the virtual agent does, it has a couple of uh, parameters for input. I'm getting my items from the SharePoint list, so I'm basically looking for a match where my title is equal to Hugo Bernier. And then I'm basically telling it inside the workflow if um, if it found a match, parse out the information, and then pass those parameters back into my virtual agent. Okay, so that's the example of um, of how you could do a, the Power Virtual Agent. If I wanted to go and I wanted to start modifying it, I can say, you know what, I'm going to ask another question here. So, what kind of a question do I want to ask? Is it a multiple choice? You have different options. These are all uh, based on entities in Dynamics in, in CDS. That's where that's where the information is stored for your virtual agents. So if I can ask a simple question like, you know, are you having a good day? I'm going to ask a Boolean. It's going to save it into, let's call this good day. I'm going to save that. It's not letting me save. That's probably being used somewhere else right now. OK, but the idea is, as you can see, is you can easily just ask, uh, add additional question. If I say, based on the response, good day, I may want to have a different, uh, a, different a different condition or different branch. And I can say, if my good day is equal to true, then I want to do one thing. If it is not true, in other words, it's false, I want to do something else. But what you can see is that it's actually really easy, really straightforward to build these kind of branches and decision trees for your virtual agent. So it's uh, you don't need to code, you don't need to do anything more complex than that. Coming back to my other virtual agent that I was building a few minutes ago, so you can see right now there's 22 suggested topics. And so this is something that it was pulling from the World Health Organization website. It has all these questions It then has the, the answers to it. So what I can now do is I can go to my existing questions. Actually, I can take all those and I will say, you know what? I want to add those topics to my, um, to my bot, to my virtual agent bot. And so what it's going to do now, it's going to take them from the suggested. It's going to move them into the existing. Takes it a couple of seconds. Just give it time. Yes, of course. Oh, there we go. So right here, where are they? So you can see right here, they're by default turned off. So I'm going to turn them on. And OK, this is obviously there's something in the system. It's a side effect of doing a demo. But normally what would happen is all these would then appear in my bot. And as soon as they're turned on, I'm then able to start leveraging them in my bot. It's as simple as that. I don't need to do anything else. So maybe it will actually let me do it. OK, so if I want to go with something like what is a coronavirus? So if it worked, here we go. So it's giving me all this information. I didn't have to type in anything. All I had to do is just say, go fetch me all these questions, fetch me the related answers. It built a bot for me within a couple of mouse clicks. And then what I can do is I can build on top of that. Um, that is, so I know it's a really quick demo that I did. I wanted to leave a bit of extra time for uh, for questions and actually maybe give you more examples. 
So I'll put the screen on for a minute or so, and I'm actually going to open up the microphones. If somebody wants to ask questions, uh, maybe do a bit more demoing, I'm happy to do so. Hello, hi, Neil. Hi. Hi, this is Michelle Norton from New Jersey. So hi, I have Michelle. a question. Are, are any of these flows going to be um, saved in a library somewhere? We can look at them? Um, I can I can definitely export them and I can put them for you in a library. What I'll do is I'll probably share them with the uh, the organizers um, so that they can share them with, uh, with the rest of the attendees. Thanks, that'd be great. For sure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Hanyu, going back to the RPA part, can you talk a little bit more about like the back end setup like required to run that? Uh, the RPA setup. So you when you go to the site, so the actual site is called powerva.microsoft.com. When you have your Microsoft 365 subscription, you need to go there and uh, you need to register. Uh, you basically register for a trial. It's the same as when you do with some of the other, other functionalities. Once you set it up, that's all you need to do in terms of a, a setup per se. There's nothing more that you need to set up manually. What I mentioned before is that your information gets stored in entities in your, um, uh, in ba it's basically part of the CDS of your tenant but you don't have to go and necessarily import or connect CDS manually. If you wanted to, you could add custom entities, but it's not a requirement. So you can literally start from register to, for Power Virtual Agent to go get a, a website or create topics and, and answers, and you're done. It's literally as simple as that. So there's no other setup required. Now, when you're done with it though, actually one, one thing I will say is if I go to my home, I wanna actually go and publish a bot. So let me go to, I'm gonna publish it. This is now I'm a bot that it's gonna do a bunch of a lot of things. So I'm gonna to go to a demo website. And so imagine this is just a, a uh, an iframe, uh, um, an embedded component in a team, in a SharePoint site, in, you know, look at directly on your phone, but you have the same information available. Okay, so that's, that's the setup that you need. You, you sign up, you build your bot by giving it topics, responses, building out your branching if, if you want to do a bit more logic, um, publish it, get the URL and you're done. That's that's kind of the end-to-end the -end process. And here you can also get information about how to publish, how to embed. Uh, once you build a, a, a virtual agent and you publish it, you can actually go into Teams and there's ways to host it in Teams or other places. Thanks. Yeah, and actually, um, Dinesh just mentioned at 4.50, he'll be talking more about the virtual agents, so make sure to check out his session as well. He might be going a bit deeper. Any other questions? Anything else you guys would like to see? We have a bit more time. Kunal here, I have a quick one. Uh, is there a ability to transfer the chat to the real uh, human? Meaning the, you know, the bot will give an option, uh, transfer it and probably conversation will transfer to a team chat and things like that? Absolutely, absolutely. So what you can do is if I go into my work, so let's say right here, what I can do is, uh, and I'm going to do this on the fly, if there's a question here, which is, 
Okay. Let's say there were some questions asked in here. We don't need this. So question, who are you looking for? You get the response. And then right in here, I can add another question. I can say, okay, this is the, let me delete the end. Okay. Uh, ask a question. I'm going to say, let's make this a Boolean with your answer. And then let's say, uh, let's call this satisfied. And I'm going to do a, and let's say condition. If you say, if the answer to satisfied is equal to false, then I can do here, um, I can do call an action. This is going to now allow me to build a workflow. So one of two things, I can pass, I can actually go to a virtual agent and pass the information to another topic, another, another virtual agent, but you're still in the chat bot. But what you'd want to do is say, okay, I want to actually go and create a new flow. And then inside of the Power Virtual Agent, the, sorry, in, into the, the Power Automate, I can say input. Um, let's say, call this the question. And then what I want to do in here is I want to do, let's say, Outlook. Um, Send an email, and let's say I'm the manager, so I'm going to send it to myself. Unsatisfied user, I can say what was the question, and in here I can put in the value or the the parameter, and let's say that's all I want to do is I just want to get notified. So if I now go back to my virtual agent, so if I'm not satisfied, call action. Give it a second to find it. Did I save it? Oh. I called it. By default, whenever you save it, it always gives it the same name, and so you're going to have about five or six different workflows, all called uh, Power Virtual Agent Flow Template. So let's see if it shows up here. Oh, here we go. Unsatisfied user. And so now I say, what's the variable that I'm passing in? It's the, let's say, the name, the question. And now if I were to run it, if, I, if it's going to let me save and, and run, I'm going to say my satisfied uh, it wants me to delete something here. Yeah, there's something here I need to I need to get rid of. But um, that's basically what would happen is I would be able to then pass the information, the the questions, anything that was conversed, whether it's the computer passing the chatbot passing it, or the user providing input, you'd then be able to take those parameters, pass them into a par uh, par automate workflow with the input parameters from the chatbot, pass it to your your uh, uh, your flow. And then inside of the flow, you can then do whatever you want. Write it to a team, an email, whatever you want of those 300 plus connected as I was talking about before. Sure, there's, thank you. There's, the, there's, yeah, there, there's actually um, a, a demo that somebody else did, which is really interesting. Um, you can actually build the chatbot that if the answer is not provided or if the, let's say the user wants to say, here's another option for an answer, you could actually take the answer, pass it to an automate, a Power Automate workflow. The Power Automate workflow can then call an RPA, the UI flow, the RPA, to then go back to the, uh, the chatbot and update the answers. So you can actually go up, down that level. And all of a sudden, 
your chatbot becomes self-sufficient. It, it is uh, enhancing itself based on input from the user. As opposed to a person having to do it manually. So, sure. um, we're just about at time for the session, so I'm going to leave a bit more time. Um, I don't know, Arik, how much time we have for questions, but I'm going to stick around if there's more questions. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Hadiel. Yeah, go ahead. Um, instead of passing it to email, could you yep. just as easily have passed it to a call center or something like that? Of course. If I have, for example, uh, so by, by call center, you meaning uh, a phone call or? Well, I'm assuming that this would be a bot that there's a lot of people using and right. it's going to be not one person just there answering the questions if they don't get answered by the bot. Right. So if I have uh, ServiceNow as one of the call center tools uh, or Salesforce or whatever the tool might be, the answer is yes. I can create a new incident record and say, go and set it up, you know, put in that, that question, and then it can be serviced. Uh, so, I'll, I'll add in too, there is the ability to, if you've got omnichannel engagement set up with Dynamics, you can hand off directly to that as well. Yeah, I, was a, I actually pasted the link to that as well. Um, so if you go um, to the uh, authoring canvas, there's the option to directly connect to the transfer agent. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. I guess the questions I've had were always so good that you never had to transfer to an agent. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's how you want to design your bot, right? <laughs> of course. That's well. That's that's the ultimate goal, right? If you yes. can, if you can get down to zero, uh, zero transfers, you know you've built a bot that is solid, right? This is where you start looking at the analytics and you say, okay, how many of my calls were transferred to an agent? What were the topics that requested a transfer? Um, all of these, all of that information would help you. And that's the idea behind the chatbots. You don't build them once and let them run. You evolve them over time to make them easier. Um, you know, if you can capture the, uh, the those triggers, or or again, if if you know that the answer was not provided and you're confident with getting an answer from a user to say, hey, this is the right answer that I was looking for, you could essentially train or build a bot in such a way that it then um, evolve, evolves itself, as opposed to somebody having to go and then change it. But now you got to start looking at you know, some quality assurance, right? So maybe maybe the new answer just gets sent to somebody at a call center and they just have to look at the question and the answer and they say approve. And that's all they need to do. They just need to approve the new the new answer option, and then the the Power Automate workflow can then go and make all the changes in the bot, as opposed to the the um, the the actual agent having to go and do it. Different options, many options available. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, yeah uh, I found the the part where you scraped the website to uh, populate the chatbot topics to be very fascinating. Can you show us a little bit more about how that? works behind the scenes and what kind of content there is? Um, yes, so let me bring up when automation. So uh, right here, and this is an example where um, I can, let me bring up a web page. Okay, let's go to the, and let's, the example did with the two thousand um, dollar. Oh, I was I was talking about the uh, the WHO oh, the, website to get the chatbot oh, topics. Yeah. Oh, that one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, for the virtual agent. Um, yeah. So basically, again, all all you have to do is if you find a website that has uh, questions and answers. Actually, there is another one here, which is I believe there's one on. Explore what it takes to become an MVP. I don't know if that's a Q&A type question. No. But if you have a website that you know has questions and answers, if I go to the one, the one that, that I was showing before, it was this one here. So this is where you have questions and answers. And there's many websites on the world that, that can provide you these type of Q&As. Right? Yeah. So. The website itself is structured. There's probably some metadata on the web page itself 
that identifies a question as a question that answer as an answer. And that's what allows the virtual agent to essentially scrape the page and pick up those topics. Yep. And then so, the answers, yep. can you show us where the answers wind up in here and how it, the, that yep. tree? Yep. yep. So let me, uh, here, why don't we do this? Let me create a brand new bot. Uh, NYC. English. And go and create that. So that takes a couple of seconds. So it will, it will start fresh, pretend we have nothing. No, it will give you a default set of questions when you build a bot. The idea behind it is that as a non-technical person, you may want to say, well, where do I start? What do I do? And so the, the default questions that you get with the bot will give you a starting point. It's like, oh, this is how I ask a question. This is how I ask a question with a branching. Um, and what are some of the basic scenarios available? Right. OK, so there's scaffolding there to uh, there's there's some. Start. Yeah, some there's some basic scaffolding and I'm as you can tell right now as a consultant, I'm trying to fill the time <laughs> while the bot creation process is happening. There you go. So right now I have my topics. The topics are the questions and yep. it has 12 standard questions. OK, there are some that are system generated. You cannot change those. So you can just leverage those, yeah. uh, but you cannot change them. But the, here are some examples, some user centric. So lesson one, right? What's a simple topic? If I go in here, I look at the simple topic. Okay. And it gives you an example of uh, the different questions. What's the message? And then it gives you uh, some basic text. Now at the bottom left, if you can see where it says test your bot, make sure to keep that on so you can actually do some real, real life, uh, real time testing. So if I do, store hours that's one of the questions in here if i do that i'm going to say i'm happy with your store hours come on there we go and then it types this text and then it says did you find this useful nice okay so cool. you've got those those basic topics available to you now if you say you know what i don't need those topics let's say i know what i'm doing so I'm going to go to my suggested topics. I'm going to type in that URL again. I'm going to say go and search. Yep. While it's doing its searching, I'm going to delete these existing ones. Yeah, so uh, this is the part that I'm interested in is when it when it retrieves all that data yeah, uh, we saw we looked at the topics. I want to see like what how it stores the answers. Can we edit those answers and yes. stuff? Yes, I'll, okay. I'll well, well, yeah, I'll get to that in one second. Once I start seeing some of the answers, there you go. Okay, it's faster this time. So I'm going to say select all, add to topic. And so now I'm going to go in here. And it should, oh, it hasn't picked them up yet. Okay. Oh, it's adding them right now as we speak. So yeah, what you'll be able to do is um, the way that this particular website is, is every one question has one answer. There's no one topic with multiple oh, uh, okay. That's That's how this one is set up. You could, I guess you could probably set up other ones that has multiple. It's being a little bit temperamental right now. It realizes that I'm doing a live demo and it's like, ha ha. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. All right, so bottom line is it brings that answer in and you have full control of editing the answer and correct uh, yeah. more to it, enhancing it, changing it, whatever you want to do. Exactly. So let's go to the simple one here. Uh, if I want to go to what is coronavirus? So the question is, what is what is a coronavirus? I can also say, you know what? What is COVID? Okay, so 19. you can enhance that. So, yeah, and okay. I can say, uh, what is uh, COVID? So the thing is, you got to be exact with your questions. If I say, I believe even case sensitive, if I say, uh, what is COVID without the question mark, it, may, it will not find an answer. 
Oh, so it's that sensitive. Okay. Right now, I believe that's what it is right now. Uh, I think we're looking at making some changes, but if I do what is COVID question mark, now it's an exact match. So now because... Uh, oh, okay, we just have to be sensitive of time here too. We're running yeah. up against our, uh, our next uh, session. So I appreciate you going through this and yeah, no worries. Don't but yeah, you can you can build it out, and and then you can you can do the answers. Um, uh, you can add the answers to these questions as well. Modify all of that once that data has been brought in. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. I have quick follow up. Yep. Uh, okay, how about the continuous learning process, right? So let's assume there is an existing call center, right, who serve their customer through email, uh, through existing chat channel. Yeah. Uh, right. And then they want to set up the bot. Right. So one time setup, I understood. Right. We can put FAQ, etc. But is there a way where it can read uh, the human chat that is occurring and learn from it so that, uh, you know, um, it's kind of an automated learning process based on what human is chatting with the customer. And another ability is kind of there is a if let's say there is a support mailbox. So whatever question is being asked and answer is being given, uh, you know, those things are automatically coming to the virtual agent, mm -hmm. you know, some way. And then admin have ability to go pick and uh, configure those. Yes, absolutely. So manually, you can definitely do it with the chatbot. The chatbot is essentially um, the interface to the user. It has the questions, it has the, the, the trigger, the topics, the answers. That's what the chatbot does. And, and it has the branching for it. When you're talking about the learning part, this is what I was showing before that if somebody asks a question and either the answer was not provided or you want to be able to refine it, you could actually use Power Automate to capture the information and then use whether it's something like AI Builder for prediction or other types of even going out to Azure to further enhance and do machine learning. You can do that and then improve and either provide the recommendations back to a uh, uh, an operator who can then go modify the bot or even go as far as modifying the bot through some automation. But that's definitely something that's possible. And that's one of the, the key goals of these bots is not to be static. Sure, thank you. Yep. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hagiel. I'm gonna stop the recording here. Sure.